title, as you can see there, the title of the message this morning is Defending the Faith in Word and Deed. Although we've seen it in the background of the whole letter up to this point, and we've seen him hinting at it here and there, this is really the first point in the book that Peter is going to address suffering head on. It's going to be his main focus. In our text, Peter exhorts Christians in that context, living in a time of suffering and tension, weariness. He's going to exhort them to live for Christ, both in word and in deed. These Christians are under great pressure. They said they're worn down. Perhaps they're at the, the brink of despair. They don't know how they'll go forward. And so Peter, the apostle, encourages them that even through trials... Christians must must live for Christ in speech and in action, both in their words and in their outward conduct. Look at the text with me. 1 Peter chapter 3, we'll begin in verse 13 and go through verse 17. 1 Peter 3, verse 13, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the apostle Peter writes, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as the the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet, do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. I believe that our response to this is quite easy to discern. I believe the Holy Spirit would have us respond to this text by honoring Christ, by defending the faith, both, again, in our actions and in our spoken words, even in the hard times, especially in the hard times. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for these brothers and sisters who are here, for visitors, God. God, I pray that you would bless our time together, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you'd be glorified as a result of our worship, having sang and worshiped in song, Lord, and now worshiping through the proclamation of the word, worshiping through giving later, God, worshiping through fellowship, through prayer. God, I pray that your grace would increase among us today. And Lord, that our faults would decrease and weaken day by day according to your mercy. Your holy name, amen. There are really three points that arise naturally from the text. The first is stand boldly for righteousness. Verse 13 says, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Basically saying, who is there to harm you? What, what an interesting way for him to begin. You know, on the, on the surface, as we look at the text, it, it might seem that he's making the point simply that, you know, ordinarily, if we live with good conduct, people won't bother us. They won't, they won't mess with us if we live a sort of upright life. It might be sort of in, in that idea, sort of part of God's common grace, that people within themselves because of God's law written on their heart, that they have some manner of respect for those who live an upright life. But I, I really think that what he's saying here primarily, on the other hand, and more clearly from the context, is he's making the point pointing to the end. Ultimately, thinking forward to the eschaton, to the end, when Christ comes, what can man do to us? When we think about the trials, the troubles, the tribulations of this life, ultimately... What do we have to fear in this world? Nothing. Nothing. We remember what Jesus says in Matthew 10, 28, when he says, don't fear those that can destroy the body. Only fear the one that can destroy body and soul in hell. Speaking, of course, of God himself. Why would we fear those in the world who can only do us temporal harm when God himself, the one who made all things that exist, holds his people in his hands? In Asia Minor, again, thinking about sort of what he's saying here, I think the making that point stronger, the people in Asia Minor that are reading this letter for the first time, they've got plenty of people that are causing them harm. 
the suffering at the very least, as I said last week, I believe, is probably discrimination, social pressure, mocking them at the other side, I think that perhaps it's even lapsing or going into the point of, of even physical abuse, of persecution. It doesn't seem to be a sort of legal, formal, imperial persecution. In fact, we know it's not imperial. There might be some legal, but probably more on the side of social pressure, animosity, discrimination, and so on. But remember what verse 12 said. The last verse we looked at last week, look there with me. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer. Lest we ever forget that God has us, that we are in his hand, we remember that point. We remember that verse. Christian, never doubt that you are in God's hands. Ever. In the good times and in the bad. What is he meaning by that point there? What does it mean to be zealous for good? One commentator, I think, has such a good, succinct definition. Tom Schreiner says, it is an ardent pursuit of virtue. An ardent pursuit of virtue. Can you grasp that? Does that describe you? Are you pursuing that which is good, that which is holy, that which is righteous? Is that you? Augustine, one of the early church fathers, one of the most important thinkers in the history of the church after the apostles, he says about this verse, he says, if you love the good, you will suffer no loss because whatever you may be deprived of in this world, you will never lose God who is the true good. Complete confidence, no doubt. Now this next verse, as we get into verse 14, is clarifying what we see in verse 13. Look there with me. Verse 14 says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. The apostle Peter tells us that blessing awaits those who stand through suffering, who stand in righteousness through suffering. Christians understand we have a, by very virtue of, of having faith, we understand that, that the trials of this life, the struggles of this life, the questions that linger in this life pale in comparison to the rewards that we face in eternity, the rewards that we know await us in eternity. And we look forward with faith. Even further, as I make this point and as I clarify what is oftentimes a misconception here in our minds, the rewards that we look forward to in heaven, they outweigh any possible blessing we could have here temporally. It's not that God doesn't bless us temporally. He does. But the blessings that we look forward to in heaven are so great, they could not be given to us in this broken wreck of a world. And that's why we look forward to them. The blessings that we look forward to are not somehow less than. We can be convinced of that. We're very short-minded people or short-sighted people. I think by nature as humans, but I think especially in our sort of microwave generation that we live in, everything is instant. We think if it's not right now, it must not be good. It must not be worthwhile. Far from it. The blessings in heaven are far too great for us to understand. And that's why we have to wait. An ancient Christian, Bede, says in the the context of those who are uh, persecuting Christians, he says about them, they don't realize when they persecute us that they are bringing us blessing. When they abuse us, they're bringing us blessing and they're bringing punishment on themselves. But yet they're blind to it and they don't realize. What a sobering thought. This really leads to my next sub point there. He says, don't fear them. He says it really twice, emphasizing it. Christians only fear God. We fear no one else. No other thing. Why would we when we understand this from the perspective of eternity? Do you tend to fall into anxiety during trials? Do you tend to fear the world around you? Uh, maybe, Maybe it's just a sort of broader spectrum. Maybe you fear the world as you look out And you see it becoming more hostile. You look at the future and and you see things and you just, you you begin to to, to fear, to have anxiety. Does that characterize you? Oh, oh, you have little faith. As Jesus would say, we, we have nothing to fear. What do we have to fear that the world can bring against us? Nothing. Nothing. 
Tom Schreiner says, the distress in this life does not constitute the last word. Peter alludes here in the verse, and some of your uh, Bibles will show that. He's, uh, he's alluding to Isaiah 8, 12 through 13, a powerful passage there and, and relating very well to the context here. It makes sense why Peter is, is drawing this in. Of course, bringing in the Old Testament is, is he's doing that often. The idea being that those who, those who trust in God will find him to be a sanctuary, a safe place, a haven. Those who fail to do so will stumble, will fall, will be broken. So church, stand boldly for Christ. You have nothing to fear in this world. Nothing. Your conduct stands as a witness for Christ. And as you live with that conduct that is holy, standing in righteous, righteousness, those who are outside will see something unique in you. It's your testimony. You can defend the faith by living the faith. Others see it, being an example of it. But not only stand, Peter says, now my second point here, speak boldly for righteousness. Verse 15. But in your hearts, honor Christ as the Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. That first point there that he's making, really, he's saying cherish Christ in your heart. Do you cherish Christ in your heart? I I love my wife very deeply. I value her in a way that is unique, unlike anyone else in the world. The way that God has designed marriage is such that there's a relationship, a binding there that is unlike anything else. Even compared to my children, there's, there's a unique bond and a value and a love that I have for my wife. I cherish her in that special way. And because I cherish her in my heart in that way, illustrating here that cherishing of Christ, because I cherish her in that way, my natural response, if I ever witnessed someone attacking her verbally, would be to defend her. Men, you know what that's like. There's this natural response to defend because I value and I cherish her in my heart. If I saw someone attacking her verbally, that would be my impulse. My impulse would be to protect her with every ounce of energy that I have. In godly husbands, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And so in the same way, if we honor Christ, if we cherish him in that way, shouldn't we have the same impulse to defend, to stand, to speak here, referring to that, to speak for the glory of God in defense of the gospel. We should have that same impulse here. It should come naturally He's going to qualify what he means by defending. Behold that. We tend to think of faith as a very private matter, don't we? In, in American society, we, there are sort of two things that are off limits. I, I heard this piece on, on NPR before uh, the holidays talking about what things, according to etiquette, is okay to talk about at sort of family dinners when you have all the family there. And always politics and religion are off the market. No. No politics, no religion. Those are very private things, right? That's how we we value things. That's sort of our cultural bias. But this ideology doesn't fit at all with Christianity. Not at all. I'm going to speak more about that in a moment. But if we cherish Christ, it won't remain a private matter. It can't. That's part of the reason that Baptists have for so long defended religious liberty in the way not just sort of what we do within the church, but within all of society, the way we live our lives, we can't just live our faith for two hours on Sunday. Our faith is a public matter. There's nothing private about it. It quickly becomes evident to others when we cherish Christ. During hardships, it comes out and it's very evident. Or on the other side, when we don't. Always be ready, the text says, to defend the faith. I think that we naturally, or at least I do, I, I know it's common for some others, maybe, maybe for you too, you naturally sort of envision a courtroom, sort of like standing before you know, the judge and sort of defending the faith in sort of this, this formal way. I, I love courtroom movies. Those are some of my favorite movies. I always talk about movies and shows. I don't, I don't know why that is. I don't really watch that many. 
But any, almost any movie, if there's a courtroom sort of theme to it, I'm, I'm going to love it. It's not primarily what Peter has in mind. It's, it's not really this formal thing. Because again, it doesn't seem that there's as much formal persecution coming against them as social pressure. Although, of course, they do face plenty of that later. We see some of that in the scriptures. Professional uh, Christian apologists, those who defend the faith for a living, that are writing books, speaking at conferences, and defending the faith in that very outward way, they love this verse. This is like their life verse, their favorite verse. And it's fitting. It fits what they're doing uh, because of the broader, broader principle. But this is not quite what Peter is envisioning. Peter is primarily envisioning those day-to-day experiences that you and I have. Where the opportunities come up, sometimes in a formal situation, but usually not so much so. We have a wide variety of circumstances in our daily lives where we have opportunities, unique providential opportunities to defend the faith. Let me give you a few scenarios. You're in your neighborhood and you're talking with some neighbors. And they say, oh, uh, are you one of those religious people? I see your car is always gone on Sundays. Are, are you one of those religious people? With sort of a derision in their voice. Now, there, then, that is your chance to give an answer for your faith. Maybe another scenario. Maybe you're with family. Someone in your family says, oh, so, I, I, so you're a Christian now? I, I hear you're a Christian now. So does that mean you're going to judge me now? I mean, you're going to judge everybody right there, then, there, now. That's your chance to defend the faith. These sort of daily things that come up all the time, not something you're going to spend eight hours preparing for and say, now I'm ready to defend, but those things that just come up all the time. Maybe it's someone at work that says, you know, man, I, I just don't know how you people can believe in God when there's all this suffering in the world right there. That is your opportunity to offer a defense for the hope that is in you. Some of you might have greater opportunities, but these are the opportunities that we encounter on a day-to-day basis. Very practical, very simple. We see the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts giving these great defenses of the faith. We see him before uh, these these high Roman uh, officials, and at one point, not only is he defending the faith, but he's trying to persuade the man. And of course, that's going to be important here. He's trying to persuade him to, to faith. And he says, already you're trying to convince me to be a Christian? And Paul says, that's right. Are you prepared to make such a defense? Do you, in those times, step up to the plate and make a defense for the faith? You should. It's your calling. If you honor Christ in your heart, if you truly believe in this gospel that is as sweet as we believe it is, why would you have any hesitation? Why? Notice the text there says, always, always be ready. Often the opportunity to give an answer comes up quickly without any warning. It's not like God wakes you up in the the morning and says, guess what? You're going to have an opportunity at work today. You say, all right, God, I'm going to read extra this morning. I'm going to pray extra. No, these things just come up. It might be the two minutes that you have at the checkout counter at Walmart. It might be a phone conversation that you have with a family member. But these things come up all the time. And if you're not ready, you'll miss it. Be ready always. But what exactly do you say in your defense? Maybe that's what you're saying to me. Well, Well, pastor, I I get that and I want to be, but I don't know what to say. What am I supposed to say? I I don't, I don't have, you know, a bunch of no learning and experience in this. What, what am I supposed to say? Well, in a context very similar to Peter's, one of the early church fathers, Cyril says very simply, tell them what faith in Christ is all about. It's that simple. Tell them what your faith is about. This isn't about pride. It's not about, as we think about defending, I think in our flesh oftentimes we think about the pride. Oh, I have to sort of defend myself so I don't look bad. It's not about upholding our own dignity. It's about being a witness for Christ. That's what we're talking about here. You don't have to have a degree in theology. You don't have to be a professional minister. You don't have to be 20 years into your Christian walk. Tell them about Christ. Tell them about the faith. Tell them the truth of God's word. 
This is a command from Peter to all Christians, not just to those who are, again, ministers or who lead an MC or those who have been saved for 40 years. All of us, be ready. However, I'm not at all undermining the fact that Christianity has a solid intellectual grounding. I'm not under, under, undermining at all the importance of learning, the importance of hard study. In fact, I'm emphasizing that. Yes, those things are valuable so that we can be ready. Christians have firm intellectual grounds. We should have no doubt there. We should never fear what science has to say or what history has to say or what culture has to say. We don't have to fear any of those things. Our God created those things. We don't fear them at all. But this reminds us here again that Christianity is a public faith and we have nothing to hide. You know, many of the faiths in the ancient world were not public faiths. They were sort of, uh, they were sort of secretive faiths mystic faiths like the Gnostics and so on, where you had to sort of know the secret knowledge and you had to work your way up. Christianity isn't that way. We're very upfront. This is what we believe. Have no misunderstanding. Here's what we believe. Rather, we proclaim boldly the gospel to those around us. Again, this ridiculous idea that we can live our faith in isolation, only keeping it to ourselves, it smacks against the New Testament. Point in case, case in point right here. Honor Christ in your heart. Always be ready. But Peter makes sure to say, and this is important here, defend the faith, he says there in verse 15, with gentleness and respect, reverence. Let me tell you, church, defending your position should never mean attacking your opponent, ever. We have no grounds to do that. You attack his arguments, you attack her arguments, the ideas, the things they're saying, but you don't ever attack the person. You don't undermine them. You don't say snide comments. As a Christian, you have no reason to lash lash out at people. Very much so the opposite. Angry and insecure people do that, but Christians should be neither of those things. We're not insecure. We're not angry. We don't fear. Ultimately, we know that we don't, that, that person that we're arguing against is not our enemy. We can be gentle and reverent because we know that ultimately only the Holy Spirit can persuade them. Only the Holy Spirit can open their heart to believe. And that gives us hope. That gives us faith. Our defense is never based in pride, but the very opposite. It's based on the grounding of God's word. It's based on our Christian witness. You and I, if you are in Christ, are ambassadors of Christ. Have you ever thought about that? What an honor. What an incredible thing. We're ambassadors for Christ. But that also means that we need to consider very carefully the person that we're representing, right? If your boss sends you out as an ambassador, you're representing him, you're representing her, you're representing the company. That really matters. We need to consider carefully who we are representing. So if in our words we defend the faith, but in our tone, in our posture, if those things are contrary to the spirit of Christ, we've not represented him well. In fact, we might bring the very opposite dishonor to God. Ironically, this, this part can be harder to grasp as we think about the importance of being gentle and, and respectful as we defend the faith. These things can be harder the more knowledge you gain because you become puffed up, become arrogant. I, I see this a lot in young seminary students. They go, especially their first year, they go through their first year, they think they know it all. I know a few words in Greek, and I know some church history, and I know words like pneumatology. I'm really smart now. And so they, they kind of have this chip on their shoulder. It's sort of arrogant. And that's the point. It's actually that point where they're most dangerous, where you know just enough to sort of be arrogant and puffed up, but not enough to actually really do any good. And so it's a dangerous time. And so we have to watch ourselves. So as I encourage you, yes, learn, yes, read, yes, study, yes, reflect, but always do it with gentleness and respect. So I've encouraged you to stand boldly for righteousness. You have nothing to fear. And let your holy life be a witness for Christ. Now, secondly, I said, speak boldly for righteousness, making a defense of the faith with your speech. Now, lastly, bringing it home, he says, suffer boldly for righteousness. Verse 16, look there with me. Having a good conscience... So that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Church, your good conduct will vindicate you, as we saw last week. 
You know, Peter expects that some unbelievers will see our righteous life and will be converted as a result of God working through that. We, we hope for that. We pray for that. But just like the blessings we talked about earlier, ultimate vindication will only come at the day of judgment. It can't be fully worked out in this world. We have to wait for the perfect that is coming. If you don't answer here, think about verse 16. If you, if you don't answer the reviling with reviling, what do they have against you as you stand before God one day? Nothing. You're guiltless. You're pure. One day God will deal with them. Verse 17 says, For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. Interesting. The opposition that Christians face should only be because of their good behavior. Important clarification there. There are some people that have sort of a a persecution or suffering complex where they're just always, people are always, they think in their minds are always attacking them. Well, sometimes it's just their own fault that has brought some of this on. We're not talking about that, but it's suffering for righteousness sake. If your suffering is due to your own sin, you forfeit. If you fall into sin, you forfeit the blessing that's due to those who suffer well. If a person is suffering because of his own mistakes, there's no reward for that. Thankfully, there's grace for that because we make mistakes, we fall. There's plenty of grace for that. God is abundant in his mercy. Why is it better for suffering for doing good rather than evil here? Wayne Grudem, one commentator says, this is so good. Because such wrongful suffering patiently endured is so remarkable that it becomes a powerful form of witness leading unbelievers to salvation. Now, if you've, if you've read ahead, you know that God uses suffering to bring about glory for himself. How could we miss the, the epitome of this worked out on the cross of Jesus Christ? God uses suffering to bring blessing and glory to his people. And yet we see that in Christ. And that's exactly where Peter's going. Verse 18 and through the rest of the chapter. Through Christ suffering in our own stead, taking the punishment that was due for us, we can be saved. The gospel is a story about redeeming, God redeeming his people through suffering. So for those who would try to to say that suffering is some sort of something on the periphery, it's not important, it might happen at some point, they miss the fact that suffering is an important part of the Christian life as we understand it. We're saved by suffering, not our own. We're saved, we're blessed by our own suffering here, but we're saved by the suffering of another, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Amen? When we suffer, we ultimately follow in the footsteps of our Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. What an honor. You know, Peter did that. In fact, Peter followed that in such a literal, in such a unique way. He actually was crucified in the city of Rome on a cross upside down, not considering himself worthy to be crucified as Christ was upright. The same emperor that's writing, that's, that's reigning as Peter is writing this, Nero crucifies Peter in Rome shortly after this letter was written. He suffered well and ultimately receives the blessing of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Church, very simply, our response, even and especially through trials, let's honor Christ by defending the faith in word and deed, in our speech and in our conduct. Let's pray.